Chapter 15, Wherein Friends Must Separate Catherine spotted Petrov and the bear lying just outside Big Root's door and winced. They didn't look as though they were in pain, but still, it must be terrible to be unable to move or talk or even blink. Can we unfreeze them now? she asked Ombrick. Maybe they can tell us where the books are. I say we fly to the center of the earth and rescue the children, North blustered. Every muscle in his body strained to do something, anything, to help the children. How do you plan to do that? Ombrick asked, folding his arms across his chest. I'll figure it out on the way, North said. Let's take things one thing at a time, shall we? Ombrick told him, looking around. Perhaps Catherine is right, and the animals can tell us what became of my books. But an enslavement spell this powerful can't be reversed quickly. It needs to be done carefully and well. He shook his head. It's the work of many, many hours. Then they'll have to stay like this until we return, North said to Ombrick. You can release them after we've crushed the Nightmare King. We'll help you. Ombrick tugged at his beard, frowning. Some of these spells are trickier than others. If I wait too long, I fear the spell could be irreversible. He looked at the porcelain creatures scattered across his floor. There are no two ways about it. I'll have to stay behind in Santoff Clausen, and you'll have to continue on to Easter Island. Easter Island? We have to get to pitch, North bellowed. Catherine added, Nightlight is hurt. The puka, if he can be found, will be able to lead you to the Earth's core, Umbrick explained. Puka lore indicates that he has a series of tunnels that span the interior of the globe. North began to object, but Ombrick insisted. By the time you reach Pitch, I expect to have restored our friends here and discovered the whereabouts of my library. Looking up at him with her steady gaze, Catherine said, You can do whatever you set your mind to. Ombrick raised an eyebrow. The student reinterprets the teacher's lesson, he said. Well done. Just do me a favor, old man, North conceded. Release Petrov first. I can't stand to see him like this. Ombrick agreed. Then, with no time to lose, Catherine, Kalish, and North left Big Root. On their way to the forest, Catherine looked into old William's frozen eyes. We'll be back, she promised him. And so will all of your Williams. She climbed onto the air shuttle, strapped Kalish into a seat, and then did the same for herself. To Easter Island. Let's hope this bunnyman creature actually exists, North said, scanning the skies for signs of trouble. There's no setting for the Earth's core. As he watched them rocket away, Ombrick knew he could trust the brave girl he had raised and the young man who had been his apprentice. They would do what needed to be done. Chapter 16. The Curl Twirls. Catherine's curl began to twirl again as she and North streaked towards Easter Island. She did not like that they could not stay together, but she was certain that Ombrick was correct. Only he could manage the delicate and lengthy task of undoing all the enslavement smells that Pitch had conjured against Santoff Clausen. The parents, the owls, the insects, the spirit of the forest, the bear, Petrov, Everything that breathed would have to be individually untoyed, as Catherine had termed it. Still, she had been brave for so long, and truth be told, she was a little weary of having to be such a grown-up. She wanted Ombrick near. He was like a father to her. And in times of danger, it feels good to have one's father near. Not thousands of miles away. But she bore this anxious feeling silently. She knew they would need to be at their very best, perhaps even more than their best, to save their friends and once again undo the dark plans of pitch. They were far above the ocean of the Pacific now. The moon was clear and bright, and so close that they thought they could see the man in the moon and his moonbots smiling down at them. They rocketed forward, faster even than they had flown on the way to Santa Clausen. 
and the stone on the magic sword that marked Easter Island blinked steadily. Catherine looked at it with alarm. Is that a bad sign? North shook his head. Quite the opposite. It means we're getting closer. Kalish honked. She's glad, Catherine said. Of course she is. We're on the wildest goose chase in history, North joked. Catherine was glad for the joke, and even more glad that, to know that North sensed her worries and was trying to cheer her. The dials of the airship let out an alarm. Up ahead was Easter Island. The sun was just beginning to rise when the ship had settled gently on a sandy beach. It cast a soft glow over the island, and Catherine could hardly wait to get out. North opened the shuttle's doors and climbed down the ladder. Catherine patted her pocket to make sure she had her dagger. Satisfied, she turned to Kalish. Stay here until I know it's safe, she told the gosling. Then she jumped onto the sand after North. Together, they began to explore the island. Hundreds of giant stone heads sat ominously across the barren beach. Catherine had seen drawings of the colossal sculptures in Umbrick's library, but they were much stranger than she'd expected, and larger than she'd imagined. North ran his hand across a mouth, a narrow slit beneath an enormous stone nose. These were carved, he said, but by who? There were no signs of life, no humans running over to see what had landed on their beach, no birds calling in alarm. Catherine and North walked among the stone heads and wondered if there were any living creatures on the island at all. The only sound was that of the waves coming in and going out. Oddly, Catherine thought she smelled a hint of hot cocoa in the salty sea air. And then she had the strangest sensation that they were being watched. And they were. One of the stone heads had turned in their direction then another, and another. With a screech of stone scraping against stone, all the heads, as far as they could see, were slowly rotating towards them. The orb on the magic sword was glowing even brighter. North took a chance. Where can we find the puka? He shouted out. We need to get to the Earth's core. On the double. The heads didn't answer. But as the echo of his shouts died away, something began to emerge from the top of each of the stone sculptures. Two stone shafts, almost like ears, slowly rose, stretching to sharp points at the tips. The heads had grown stone rabbit ears, every one of them. Catherine and North exchanged uneasy glances. Then something, or someone, twisted up out of the ground a dozen feet away, sending sand and grass flying in all directions. Catherine and North found themselves looking at an extremely tall rabbit. He stood completely upright, not crouched like a bunny. He was at least seven feet tall, with ears, and wore green egg-shaped glasses and a thick green robe with egg-shaped golden buttons. Around his waist was a purple sash and waistcoat with egg-shaped pockets. He held a tall staff with an egg at its tip. Catherine gave the rabbit man an uneasy smile. The rabbit did not respond. He didn't even blink. In fact, he was so still that Catherine thought he might be a statue too. She took a step closer, but to her utter surprise... A group of armor-covered eggs with tiny arms and legs emerged from under the hem of the rabbit's robe. The eggs raised their bows. Their arrows, she noticed, had tiny egg-shaped points. Catherine pulled back again, but North was less cautious. He'd seen the n rabbit's nose twitch and had an inkling. "'You are the puka, I presume?' he asked." The rabbit became a sudden blur of motion. In less than a blink, he was standing directly in front of them. I am E. Aster Bunnymund, 
he said in a deep, melodious voice, I've been expecting you. Chapter 17, in which Pitch appreciates North's ingenuity, but proves to be a dark customer indeed. North's mechanical gin was a truly inspired invention. Pitch took delight in not only the theft of his enemy's creation, but also in the wonderful things it could do. While he was inside the gin, Pitch could not only venture out into the sunlight, he could turn into any number of machines, most notably one that could fly. The perfect way to transport the children across a vast distance. With the children and nightlight trapped within his lead cloak, Pitch had transformed the gin into just such a machine. He cared nothing for beauty, but he appreciated the elaborate design of the flying sled machine that swelled out of the gin's shoulders, back, and arms. Every floorboard, deck, and bolt was a mechanical marvel. A surge of envy rolled through him, for it was clearly a combination of ancient magic and human invention that had created this masterpiece. The Nightmare King had never imagined anything that even approached North's genius, but he would. Oh, once he had all the books in the wizard's library, he would. He narrowed his eyes and issued a curt command to the djinn. Take me to the core. Propellers began to spin, and within seconds, the sleigh was piloting across the sky, crossing continents, then oceans, finally landing upon one of the most desolate places on earth, a volcano at the very top of the Andes Mountains. Inside the cloak, the children of Santa Clausen whispered to one another about where they might be and whether or not Ombrick and North had already started their rescue mission. William, the absolute youngest, fumed in the darkness. I wish I had a sword, he muttered. I do too said his oldest brother. If I had North's new sword, why I'd... Silence! roared Pitch. The volcano was a shortcut to his new lair. As they entered the open fissure of the volcano, the flying machine's propellers folded tight. They were speeding down faster and faster, straight for the center of the earth. The children, trapped in an inky darkness of Pitch's cloak, could see almost nothing though their ears began to pop. Their only light was Nightlight's considerably diminished glow. Tall William and Petter, aided by fog, tried to push their way out of the cloak prison, to no avail. The black cloth wasn't woven, but made of a metal mesh that was flexible but impenetrable, no matter how hard the boys pushed and clawed at it. Sasha did her best to comfort William, the absolute youngest, and some of the other children, but she was the most concerned about nightlight. He lay slumped against the cloak, his eyes closed. His light grew more and more faint. It started to flicker. William, the absolute youngest, cried out, Is he dying? Tears slipped down the children's cheeks. They held their breaths, watching and hoping that the youngest William was wrong. Sasha grasped Nightlight's hand. It felt strange in hers, like it was made of light and air and crystals. But in a moment, he began to glow, faintly again, and she breathed a sigh of relief. To her surprise, Nightlight reached out, collected her tears in his hand, and then did the same with those of the other children. He closed his fists tight around them before pulling his fist to his chest. The children could see where the bookworm was hiding under Nightlight's jacket. I hope Mr. Query is all right, said Sasha. Remember, whispered Petter, we mustn't tell Pitch about Mr. Query. Just as they all nodded in agreement, they slammed down on a hard rock surface. The children tumbled onto a hard floor scraping their knees and elbows. Then Pitch flung open his cloak, sending them spinning and rolling in all directions. Sasha banged into a wall. Petter rolled away from Pitch's raised foot only seconds before he brought it down, 
hard. Tall William did his best to gather the youngest children in a tight group. They were in, the, in a giant room with walls of grayish melted looking metal. The air reeked of sulfur. Shallow pools of milky lava flowed around one end of the room. The children could feel feelings weaving in and out of their legs like shadowy black cats. Fog flinched and batted furiously at one that seemed to be whispering in his ear. Sasha pressed her lips together and swallowed a scream as another slithered around her face and head. Nightlight had helped them see inside the cloak, but here the wall seemed to absorb his dim glow, leaving them in a darkness so thick they began to wonder if Pitch had swallowed up all the light in the world. Then there was a sound like fingers snapping, and blue flames appeared from the lava pools, casting everything in an eerie glow. The feelings pulled back from the light, but couldn't resist continuing to reach for the children, their long, tentacle-like fingers creeping within inches of their faces. The older boys drew the younger children behind them, and they all instinctively formed a protective circle around nightlight. Pitch smirked at their efforts. He commanded the gin suit to transform itself back into a metal man. Then an inky vapor rose out of the gin's ear, oozing outward and sharpening into the shape of Pitch, most preferable for himself. He kicked the mechanical suit aside and loomed over his hostages. Sasha felt the hands of the smaller children reaching for hers, pulling at her sleeves. She forced herself to stay calm. Ombrick, North, and Catherine would move heaven and earth to come to their rescue. She knew that as surely as she knew that the sky was blue, the grass was green, and fireflies cheated at games of tag. Still, she couldn't keep herself from averting her eyes as Pitch's gaze lingered on each of them. When he reached Tall William, however, the boy stared back. You said you had no plans to hurt us, Tall William said as Pitch loomed over him. I remember what I said, boy, Pitch answered. If your precious wizard hands over his library, perhaps I'll keep my promise. Or perhaps not. Then he pointed his long, skeleton arms towards nightlight. But you, he added with a malevolent smile aimed directly at the spectral boy, are another story. Nightlight stared back at Pitch with a weak but mischievous grin. The children's strength was feeding his own, and his light was steadily brightening. He thought of Catherine and how much he wanted to see her again, and became stronger still. He had spent thousands of years trapped inside this monster. He could survive whatever he wanted to do to him now. Enraged by Nightlight's smirk, Pitch raised his hand as if to crush him. Sasha shrieked, but Nightlight's grin only grew wider. I'll turn you into my feeling prince, Pitch threatened, and your friend Catherine, when she arrives, will be my princess. Nightlight knew exactly what Pitch was doing, trying to frighten him by threatening Catherine. He deliberately smiled wider. Pitch reached out his long, gnarly hand, and with agonizing slowness, let his fingers hover just an inch from Nightlight's head. Now you will be mine. You've kept me imprisoned for centuries. Day after day, year after year, I dreamed of revenge. He lowered his hand, but the instant he gripped Nightlight, there was a brilliant explosion of light sending Pitch staggering backward. He grasped his hand in pain, and for a moment, his palm and fingers seemed to glow, then became flesh-colored. The look on Pitch's face was an unsettling mix of fury and something else, something the children had never expected to see, something that looked like sorrow. Pitch screamed, he covered his injured hand with his cloak and pulled out his sword with his other. 
then pointed toward a small cramped cell that hung suspended from the ceiling. A swarm of feelings picked up Nightlight and threw him inside the lead cage. Please be my guest, Pitch said, his voice suddenly taking on a cheerful tone. In this solid lead prison, created especially for you. Pitch slammed the door with the tip of his sword. The sword's point then transformed and sharpened into the shape of the key. He locked the door, and the key transformed back into his sword. The only way to open that door will be to kill me, he said with a gleeful smile. And who amongst you is up to that? Then he laughed in a way that left the children feeling helpless.